straight homework? No? Okay. Ask me Wednesday if you have questions. Okay, we only have two people. I guess it's crunch time for senior design. Mm, let me wait another half a minute. Oh, three people. All right, so let's go forward with the example. All right, so today we'll finish talking about stability and statics, and we'll, we'll then talk about hydrodynamics. So um, to finish this example, let me just recap. We were looking at a barge that popped a hole here and got flooded, okay? And then we had to figure out, is it still, um, uh, what, what's the, Wait, where is the question? Yeah, what's the final four and a half drafts uh, once it settles down with the hole? Um, so we figured out, okay, first it will sink a bit more. How much will it sink? So we figured out um, roughly point, half a meter, 0.46. That's one change in draft. Other thing that will happen is there's extra weight here. So nose down. And that's what we were trying to figure out. How much uh, moment? Uh, moment arm times the weight of the water that enters. And that's what, where we had stopped. So this much total moment. Once we know the moment being applied, we can figure out the trim. So once we know the trim, we can figure out aft trim and forward trim. So that's what we will do. So to compute the change in trim caused by this moment, we need So sometimes the MCTC is given to us, sometimes it's not. If it's not, we just compute it. If you look back um, in your notes, you'll find this uh, MCT is W times GM longitudinal. Divide by L. So to find GM longitudinal, we just need to do KM longitudinal minus KG. The, the two values here are known. This is given to us. This is 2.5. KB. What is KB? What is KB? Buoyancy center. One point five meters. 
Okay, you're talking about before damage. Yeah, we have 3.46 divided by two. Okay, so with our new draft is that dashed line. So our new KB will be a bit higher. All right, so to find the unknown BML, um, we have I, um, <clears throat> IYLCF divide by NABLA. We, we didn't change the, the cargo load of the hull. We didn't throw any people overboard. So NABLA will not change. The displacement of the hull doesn't change, right? Um, uh, after you poke the hole, it uh, submerged a bit more to get the dry submerged volume back, uh, displaced volume back. So this does not change. And it's still equal to L times B times T. Okay, what about this guy? So let's draw the hull. <clears throat> Beam was uh, 10 meter and length was 60 meter. So what's I Y or what's the I we're talking about now? You say 52 because this part is flooded, correct? Yeah. And that's useless for us for water plane and providing anything of use. So Uh, you say 52 times 10 Q divided by 12. Um, are you talking about this? Yeah, it's the other way. It's the longitudinal, right? We're, we have to talk about this guy. So this is our axis of rotation. So I longitudinal this is 10 times 52 cubed divided by 12. So when you plug that in, this gives you BML ends up being 65.1 meter. Okay, and then you have your GM. Is this number surprising? I mean, we've all, always had 0 0.5 or one, order of one. Now we have 64. Why, why is it more than 10 times? larger now. No, I mean, GM is positive, right? So still stable, fine. 
but why does it seem to be so much more stable than our previous examples and previous questions? Think about previous examples, what were we talking about? Which type of stability? We're always concerned with role stability, right? But this guy is not related to role, related to pitch. So that's why this number comes out to be huge. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we never expect our ship to go this way. We always worry about the role because um, longitudinal stability is almost never a problem. Okay, so we have a longitudinal GM, and this we need it to compute our MCT. So now we can compute MCT. Again, reminder this is moment to change trim by one meter. Weight is uh, volume times density. Um, ton meter, if you compute it in Newton meter, that's fine as well. So once you know MCT, so you can compute delta trim. So that's, that's our other change in water line. First change was sinkage, change in trim is the other change. And as usual, uh, we will do our uh, water line diagram. So this is nose down. Which means our water line is up. and LCF.
Once you have this diagram, it's very easy. So tan theta. And then we have our final trim. T forward is initial trim plus the sinkage. And since this is nose down, um, we have we will add the delta T F. Um, yeah. And you'll end up with five point seven five meter. Okay, any questions? Okay, at this point, do you feel comfortable with analyzing hulls for stability using integrals? What happens if they're damaged? You, you know where to start at least. And there's always Google to take you further, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, but, but that's true. You know, even when we do research, we learn very basic stuff in class. And then after that, it's Google. Um, so uh, that, that, let, let's switch over to, you know, we'll stop talking about stability from this point forward. Um, try your homework. Uh, we'll do a quiz after you submit it based on that homework that's up right now. No, no, because um, one week after your homework is due. Okay. Um, so probably the last week of class. Homework is due Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. Um, and, and again, you, you can drop the lowest score on your quiz. Two out of three. Okay. Um, all right. So. Let me let me ask you a few things. Uh, have you have you heard the term Buckingham Pi theorem? No. Mm, they were supposed to have taught you in fluid mechanics. Mm, dimensional analysis. A little bit. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, uh, oh. Hopefully, it'll come back when we start talking about it. Okay. 
<clears throat> is this the thing where you make everything dimensionless? Yeah, you try to make everything dimensionless because it helps. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we did cover that. Okay, okay. It helps with reducing the number of variables you have to deal with. Um, oh, okay. All right. So I guess you just didn't um, use the name Buckingham Pi theorem. Uh, but that's the concept I'm talking about. So we have a dimensional analysis. So the reason we care about dimensional analysis is we don't want to build a full scale ship and then test it and figure out, oh, I messed up the design and change it again and build another full scale ship. So we want to be able to test things at much smaller scale before we actually make the full prototype. And dimensional analysis is crucial in that, uh, in that, uh, in that sense. So very useful. or testing. <clears throat> Have you heard of this guy called Frude? Okay, why have you heard of him? All right, do you remember Reynolds? Okay, so Reynolds is, we are very familiar with. What about Frude? Okay, um, so um, and Professor Gleick probably mentioned it, I mentioned him in your fluids class. Um, uh, just like we have a Reynolds number, we have another number called the fruit number. And we use both these numbers when we design chips. Okay? So we, we will use these two numbers heavily when we try to understand how to test small scale models. Okay? Um, and before we go there, let me just tell you what Buckingham Pi theorem is. We won't go into too much detail, but I, I just want you to be familiar with it.
So you probably remember the drag coefficient. Um, do you remember what drag coefficient depends on? Or first of all, do you remember what the drag coefficient is? Drag coefficient depends on the Reynolds number. And what other thing? Uh, drag coefficient doesn't depend on the cross-sectional area, but when you want to go from coefficient to force, you need the cross-sectional area. So think about this. Um, there's a, a car and a wrecking ball, roughly of the same size. Do they have the same drag coefficient? No, because... Is the term similitude ring a bell? So these two objects are very dissimilar in shape. The flow around them will be very, very different. So you don't expect any similarity between the two. But if you have a full scale car versus a small 120 model, same shape, same everything, Nature doesn't know that there is a difference, okay? Um, if you operate the two at the same Reynolds numbers, the flow will behave the same, okay? So that's why non-dimensionalization is so important. Uh, same idea for ships. If we have the full scale ship and we make a 3D printed small scale model, nature will not know the dif uh, difference between the two as long as we operate under the same conditions. All right, and all of this non-dimensionalization comes from here, the Buckingham Pi theorem. Um, so reducing the number of variables, it helps a lot. So this is, how is this helpful? So uh, this is, If I give you a wrecking ball and a bowling ball, and let's assume we plug all the holes and make everything smooth. And I ask you to compute the drag acting on the balls for different flow speeds. What do you do? You know how to do these tests? How to compute drag acting on an object? All right, we need to send all of you back to fluid mechanics. Mm, have you been to our wind tunnel? 
that's one way to test it, right? You put things in a wind tunnel and uh, measure the force acting on the object. So do we, would we go and, assuming our wind tunnel is strong enough, would we go and mount this um, bowling ball, run it for 10 different flow speeds, then do the same with the, with the other one, the wrecking ball? They would be similar. So there's not really a need to do this. I mean, I can give you um, 20 more objects, spherical objects with very different sizes. Well, think about, you, you'd go crazy just uh, go, doing experiments over and over. You don't need to do that because of this bucking up by the theorem and um, non-dimensionalization. So, uh, you, if, if for a spherical object, um, you might have seen this graph. CD versus RE, that's uh, it's a bad drawing, but the graph looks somewhat like this. Okay. Uh, what is CD? CD is F drag divided by half rho Z squared times S. This is called the drag coefficient. Use flow speed, obviously. All right, and Reynolds number is rho mu d over mu, or u d over nu. The, um, if you if you throw a baseball here on Earth, let's say it'll follow this um, chart for a given Reynolds number. You can tell me what the drag coefficient is. What if you go and play baseball on Mars? Yeah. What if you go play baseball on on the Moon? You need to redo the experiment, put a wind tunnel up on the moon and do the experiment again. So moon is a trick question, Mars is not. Okay, there's no atmosphere on the moon, all right? But on, on what? It wouldn't just be a what? Oh, the drag force. Uh, no, no, no fluid, no drag. This, why would there be drag if there's no atmosphere? Yeah, you, you're not, you're moving through vacuum if there's no atmosphere. So you don't experience any drag. But on Mars, there is an atmosphere and it's very, very rarefied. So we need to put a wind tunnel on Mars and redo this experiment and figure out the new drag curve, correct? No, not correct. <laughs> That's the beauty of non-dimensionalization, see? The atmosphere on Earth, air has a certain viscosity. Air on Mars would have a different viscosity. So 
So all of that is accounted for in here. That, that is the very simple but very elegant concept of non-dimensionalization. Um, so a spherical object um, anywhere in the universe will follow this curve, uh, assuming we're working with a Newtonian fluid. Okay. Um, and a spherical object of any size will follow this curve. Well, see, the reference area gives us a way to account for the size. Rho gives us a way to account for the fluid. Nu is another way to account for the fluid. So um, just with these two numbers, we can describe um, the behavior of many, many different types of objects. This curve only applies for uh, spherical objects or a car. The curve would look very different, but same concept remains. For a given Reynolds number, you would have the same CD. Um, this is all you need when you talk about things operating in air or in a gas. But when we um, are fully submerged, but when we talk about um, things that operate on the surface of water, in addition to the Reynolds number, we have to care about the other number, the fruit number. Okay. So um, let me write a few things here. So you can see dimensionless or non-dimensional, same thing. What do I mean by they can be recovered using the Buckingham Pi theorem? So I don't want to show you the details. Again, I was hoping you would cover that in fluid mechanics, but it's not very complicated if you want to take a look at it separately. Um, so think about it. When people were doing this 300 years ago, they didn't know these things. They didn't know what CD was, what RE was. Uh, Reynolds did his experiment in 1800 something. So before that, they would do what we were saying. For every different object, you try to figure out what the flow behaves like. Again, none of this was very scientific 300 years ago. Um, and that's crazy how, how far we have come. Okay. Um, um, then, um, uh, uh, so how, how did they figure out that this is the combination that we should use? They just kept trying different things. Is that what they did? They would try rho us or rho ul didn't work. So they would try thousands of different combinations. No, they, they wouldn't. They used dimensional analysis and the Buckingham Pi theorem to realize that, okay, these are the two independent variables that I need. I don't need anything else to characterize this particular problem, right? So that, that's how people were able to simplify many problems. 
Um, so one more thing I'll mention is we don't have fruit here, but we will need to uh, use the fruit number. So bear in mind. Have you seen this before? <laughs> yeah. It's the dispersion relation from wave mechanics. So um, when objects move on the water surface, they generate waves, which do follow this relation. They have to. Um, is that a good thing? Object, are ships moving through water create waves? It, it looks nice, so it's a good thing, yes? No. Why not? The wave shows force acting against the hull. Um, not entirely so wouldn't it just be a vibe like wouldn't it be that it would happen the waves occur because the boat is trying to go against i don't know the waves so then it would they would just go around it and kind of i don't know uh, but i mean then uh do you say that on a very calm day in a lake there would be no waves generated by the boat you're right you're right I think there, there. the problem is, is that all the uh, energy in the waves has to come from the power of the uh, boat to go through the water, which, you know, is related to its drag force. Yeah, that's um, your, the waves didn't exist before you were moving the boat through the water. The waves only exist because you are doing so. Um, and you created the waves, you have given them energy, they need energy to exist. Where did that come from? That came from you burning fuel to uh, run your engine. And this is completely useless for us. Um, you're, you're throwing away energy, generating waves, which are not serving us any useful purpose. So um, this is one of the sources of power loss or drag 
when we talk about um, moving objects. What's the other source of drag? Other big source of drag? Just think intuitively. So you're generating waves, you're throwing away energy. What other, um, what was that? Wind. Wind, uh, are, all right. So wind, yeah, there is some drag created by the wind, but mm, that's a smaller component. Frictional component of the viscosity and the difference in velocity between the, you know, the stationary fluid and the hull. Yeah, so think, imagine you swimming through water. Um, there's two types of forces acting on you. One is pressure trying to slow you down and the other is there's fluid uh, moving, uh, it's rubbing against you. So there's friction. And that's a huge component of drag for hulls, frictional drag. Assuming you create a nice streamlined hull, frictional drag is a huge component. If you create a, something very bulky and boxy, then pressure drag becomes the uh, uh, big thing to worry about. Okay, so all of these different things uh, contribute to drag or resistance that we have to overcome with our engine. All right, um, and and we'll talk about how to analyze all of these different things. So let me just point out here, uh, this is for gravity waves. And if you remember from wave mechanics, gravity waves are just, um, this is one term and there's another term that's related to um, surface tension effects. These are called capillary waves. Capillary waves. Okay, and um, when the wavelength is very, very small, order of a few centimeter or smaller, surface tension effects become dominant. But when talking about ships and objects, we, uh, the waves are never that tiny. So we are primarily concerned with the gravitational effects. Okay, so let's talk about resistance for ships. And resistance is just an old school term um, used in the field for drag. Okay, so you, you call it resistance, you call it drag, same thing. All right, just a few sentences.
Another thing to note is, as you were saying, we have air and water resistance. So um, ships move. Can you think of an incident where air resistance was higher than water resistance? Recent. Sure. The uh, sailboat. Um, that's, yeah. The only reason a sailboat moves is um, your sail generates drag, okay? not really drag, but thrust. And if that thrust is greater than the, uh, the resistance, produced by the water, then you move forward. Um, an unintentional place where this happened was, well, that's what they're saying. Uh, it's the, the ship that, got, that blocked the canal. There was a lot of wind. And if you imagine the superstructure, well, the, the, the cargo containers on top of the ship provide a huge, it, it's basically like a huge wall and if there's a lot of wind sideways, it pushes the ship air resistance. And if that's larger than the water resistance that the hull generates, your ship will move. And that's how they say it got launched. Uh, so it can happen that you get it flipped just because the air speed, the velocity of the wind is very, very high. Okay, but usually during normal operation, we, we, the contribution to drag from um, the air is smaller than water. Okay, and um, if we imagine what the flow looks like, let's say we have an object that looks like an ellipse. And you have nice inflow here. <clears throat> what is going to happen? What will happen to the flow if there's, well, this is a frame of reference where you're on the boat, so the water is coming towards you. Um, if you are standing on the beach, then you see the boat is moving, the water is stationary. It's just a change of reference frame. So, so you're streamlined yeah. you go around the object. And then? And then they're gonna come back together again, and there might be some vorticity, you know, in the wake or whatever. 
uh, yeah, so the flow won't just go smoothly around the object and then come back and go along as if nothing was there. Um, that only happens for um, theoretical fluid flow, meaning if you do potential flow, then you get that sort of behavior. But in reality, the, the flow will come, it'll notice the object, so it'll go around, and at some point, the boundary layer will separate. Uh, okay, boundary layer, you know what boundary layer is? Have you heard the term boundary layer? Flow separation? So oh, these are the streamlines, okay? And you, you see they go along the object, but at some point they get separated from the object here. This is flow separation. Is this good or bad? It's bad. It, it's very, very bad. It uh, increases the drag substantially compared to if your flow was completely uh, hugging the object. Okay, so uh, that's one thing we try to avoid when we... Is that what causes some cars to slide out, like from the back or something? Uh, flow separation, you mean to lose traction? Yeah, like does, does that cause the cars losing traction when they're going too fast? No, if... um, that is... Yeah, that is complicated. Um, you know, some cars uh, need active downforce. So you'll notice some of them have inverted wings on the back. So that basically generates a negative lift and it keeps them on the ground. Um, I'll, I'll show you a video where this was a problem, but it's not, uh, it's not, due to the flow separation, but because of the way the flow goes over the body overall, right? Uh, here, no, notice, what do you notice? What's the big difference? Yeah, the, the streamlines stay attached to the body much more compared to the, the old Corvette, okay? And uh, I mean, if you think about it, the two cars have very different fun functions. The Corvette is a muscle car and this guy needs to go fast. So this hopefully tells you how um, aerodynamics influences the design of cars. Same exact way hydrodynamics influences the design of your hulls. Is there a difference between the two? Yeah, there, there is not a difference between the two. Again, nature doesn't care about whether you're working with oil, liquid, um, air, or water. The, as long as the Reynolds number is the same, the behavior will be the same. There is one difference, air is compressible, okay? So things start getting, uh, start looking different if you're going very, very fast. Have you heard of the term Mach number? Yeah, if you're approaching close to the speed of sound or going 30 times the speed of 30% of the speed of sound, uh, things, air, uh, uh, water will start behaving differently. But if you're slower than 30% of the speed of sound, it's fine. Okay? It's incompressible versus compressible flow. So 
So this is actually a project that my undergrad, one of my undergrad student group did in the fluid mechanics class I was teaching here. Um, then this is a lab that I did when I was an undergrad, where you have, so you, um, this is for an aerospace engineering lab, but you know, we have rudders in ocean engineering. So when you design these things, expect the same stuff to happen. So we start the fan and start the smoke lines. And you see the smoke lines come in. There's a very nice three-dimensional effect at the tip. You, you get this curling. If you've noticed aircraft flying, you always notice at the tip, there's this little, you know, tube that gets, or circular tube that gets shed. That's the reason why. Okay. And um, so right now everything is nice and attached to the body, but if you start changing the angle, you see things get separated. So same thing will happen to your ships or your rudders. If the angle, uh, if the flow is not, uh, streamlined anymore, meaning, you know, you, when you change the angle of attack, you're, uh, you're not behaving like a streamlined object anymore. You, your flow will separate. All right, then boundary layer. Uh, did I show you the boundary layer? No. Uh, boundary layer. Uh, I guess it's easier to see in a simulation. When you have any object that moves through fluid, you have this very thin region around the object where um, you, you, you have very strong viscous effects. So that's the colored layers you're looking at here. The, Blue indicates vorticity one way, red indicates vorticity another way. You know what vorticity is, yes? Okay, good. Uh, so any object moving through, this is a simulation of a, like a simple fish swimming. So any object moving through the fluid will have this boundary layer. And when the boundary layer separates from the object, that is when the drag increases substantially. Um, and uh, it, it is unavoidable that separation will happen, but what we can control is when it happens. Does it happen upfront or we delay it as much as possible? So we want to delay it, separation as much as possible. So the streamlines might look something like this. This is called, this is the wake, basically. And we see this when we see the foamy region around, uh, behind a ship or a boat. Again, that's wasting energy. See, you're making the fluid spin and it's doing absolutely nothing. So you're uh, throwing away your uh, translation energy to rotational energy for the fluid. <clears throat> so in this, uh, for objects moving on the, on water surface, you can show um, uh, using Birking and Pi theorem or using dimensional analysis,
in, in this case, the um, CD, the drag coefficient, becomes a function of the Reynolds number, which we know already. Something called the fruit number and PP, pressure coefficient, cavitation number. And you already know Reynolds number is an, it, it indicates, uh, um, it's the ratio What is it, the ratio of the Reynolds number? What does high Reynolds number versus low Reynolds number tell you? Reynolds number of 10 versus Reynolds number of 10,000. What is the difference? Well, it's gonna tell you your velocity, but also for turbulence versus laminar flow, basically. All right. Um, you're talking about um, instability, which leads to turbulence. So um, low Reynolds number, less likely to be turbulent because? So th think about, okay, so uh, maybe a different example. Think about flow, something moving through honey and something moving through water. Which one has a higher Reynolds number? Same speed, same size. Honey will be? Viscosity is higher in honey, yes. Right, so Reynolds number would be lower when a fly is stuck in honey versus when it's trying to move in water. Okay, so uh, Reynolds number tells you how important inertial forces are compared to viscous forces. Okay. Um, if the Reynolds number is small, that means viscous forces are increasingly important, like honey. And um, this separation, etc., becomes. Um, less likely when you have honey because any disturbance will be quickly killed off, right? The viscosity will uh, suppress these instabilities, but that's not good. I mean, we suppress the wake, but then we get a lot of friction when we try to move through honey on the surface. Okay. So there's always something that messes us up. Um, and and that, that's why we have jobs, right? We, our, we, we try to optimize these things. So ratio importance of inertial forces.
to viscous forces. <clears throat> it's not just changing water to honey. Look at this D. If you change the size, let's say uh, a boat versus a bacteria in water, what do you expect? Who will be higher in all summer? The, the boat would have a much larger Reynolds number, okay? The bacteria is on the order of a micrometer. So the Reynolds number will be very, very, very small. Although they're moving through the same fluid, the bacteria will experience much larger viscous effects compared to inertial effects. So that's why remember, it doesn't matter what fluid you're using, what is the size of the object, what is the speed of the object, what matters is the combination. So low RE means viscous effects more dominant. <clears throat> Fruit number similarly gives us the it's the ratio of Inertial effects to gravity effects. And this guy is pressure effect. When you talk about fluid mechanics, in addition to these non-dimensional numbers, there are two others, which are not useful for dynamics, but uh, they, they uh, still useful to know about them. So, One is called the Mach number. Another called the Weber number. Definition of Mach number is speed over speed of sound. Weber number is rho u squared.
Okay. Any questions? Or ship hydrodynamics, surface tension, um, have, uh, yeah, it, it uh, works at very small scales, right? So if you talk about bubbles in water, surface tension effects become very, very important. Gravity effects become useless. So in that, web, the Weber number is useful when talking about how bubbles behave in water. Okay. Yeah, that's why we have, um, where was the omega squared? So for ocean waves, we only consider the gravity term, not the surface tension term. More questions? All right, so we're out of time. Next class, we'll talk about how to compute these um, uh, resistances and how to do testing in a towing tank. Don't forget your homework is due on Wednesday. Okay, see you guys.